When the time came of their purification according to the law of Moses that had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and offer a sacrifice in keeping with what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple's courts. When the parents brought the child, Jesus, Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law was required, Simeon took him into his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, you have done as you had promised. You now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have repaired in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and risings of many in Israel, and to be the sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and as a sword will pierce your soul too. I figure why I even walk behind there. I'm just going to leave. I want to start this morning doing something a little bit different, and I want to invite you to be a part of that with me. It's fine. What is going on here? What is going on here? These are the words that are reflected in the eyes of a young couple standing in the freezer section of Walmart. This is the first time they've ever brought their new baby out into public. And like any new parents, they're a little bit scared. They don't know what it's going to be like for this new life to be around this many people. But the fact of the matter remains that even though they took a careening drive to the hospital at 3 a.m., spent 36 hours in labor and have spent the last two weeks staring over the side of a crib at the most perfect thing they have ever seen. 
doesn't change the fact that the bridge didn't refill itself. So here they are in Walmart. They figured that people are going to want to see this kid because who doesn't want to see a baby? As these new parents look at their baby and they say, who's not going to want to see this baby? It's the most perfect thing we've ever seen. This is their expectation. What they don't expect is this guy running down the aisle toward them and somewhere between the two-for-one chicken cutlets and the great value vanilla ice cream, he doesn't even ask but just picks this kid up and holds it in the air like somebody who takes the Lion King far too seriously. <laughs> and starts to talk in a voice so loud it almost sounds like a song so loud that you can hear it in the deli counter. God, you have dismissed your servant. I can die now. I can die in peace. Because I've seen your hope for everyone. A light in the dark places, Lord. And there are dark places. God, there are riots in our streets. There are diseases tearing apart families. God, there are wars being fought against enemies we have never seen. And families who don't feel safe to take their children to school or go with their family to the movies. There is darkness. And in the midst of all of this, you show me this. Look. Look. Can't you see? Can't you see? He has his father's eyes. With that, the man carefully hands the child back to its young mother. And his voice changes. His inflection shifts. His tone deepens. This is the quietest he's been since he ran down aisle four. He looks her in the eye and he says, Ma'am, your son is going to change this world. It's destined to. He will speak to the hopeless and show them a hope that they never knew existed. He will speak to the poor and show them that they have everything that they have ever needed. And his words will pierce the hearts of the oppressive. So that everyone will know them for who they truly are. And I hate to be the one to tell you that. But there are going to be some who don't like what your son has to say. Selfish people, confused people, and they will come for him. He can take it, but it's going to hurt you worst of all. So sorry. With that, tears streamed down the man's weathered face, falling in tiny puddles of blue and white linoleum for. He looked one more time in the face of this child and smiled through his own tears as he said, he has his father's eyes. As quickly as he came, the man hurried out the store through the automatic doors to the parking lot. The stunned husband put his arm around his wife. And their eyes, their eyes spoke only one question. What do we do now? This is the same question that we find ourselves asking this morning. 
What do we do now? Now on the other side of Christmas. All the preparation, all the time and effort that it took to get us there. And now here we are post-Christmas. There are no presents under the tree except for the one from that relative that you thought was coming but didn't. And the elves on the shelves have now gone back to wherever it is that elves on the shelves go. And we ask ourselves, what do we do now? I say preparation and I think of this. Our church spent the last month plus preparing for the birth of Christ. Look at this room. We changed the way we worshipped. We changed the way our worship space looked. We changed the way we dress, and we changed the way we sang and acted. For Hanging of the Greens, we turned something beautiful into something more beautiful. I say we changed the way we dress because Dr. Stansel and the other ministers and I donned what I like to call my preaching dress, robes and stoles, uh, literal garments, that show that you feel and you've blessed our calling to be shepherds and teachers, proclaimers of the gospel, servants of Christ. I say that we changed the way we sang because the Christmas choir, and y'all know, spent how many months? Two, three, maybe more? Four with childcare, preparing for the cantata, and it showed. I say we changed the way we acted because I can stand here as your missions minister and say that 317 boxes went overseas for Operation Christmas Child. I can say that I traveled with Adam Fitzgerald with 90 Christmas trees that this church donated to families in need. I can say that 33 families here in Wake Forest, that's over 90 children, received Christmas presents because of the generosity of people in this room. We sang Christmas carols together. And all of this preparation culminated in not one, but two Christmas Eve services. As we prepared for the one time in human history that the realm of God intersected with our lives, where God became man. It's enough to make you all feel tired. I feel tired just rattling it all off at once. And it's easy to get complacent. But a question remains. What do we do now? The scripture that was read and shared with our children and retold in a different way is a post-Christmas story. It's actually the first post-Christmas story. The story of Simeon in the temple takes place a month and then a week or two, so a month and a couple of weeks, after the birth of Jesus. That's how old he is. I can say that with confidence because at that time period, it took 40 days for a woman who delivered a son to be ritually clean again, to be able to go into the temple. It was a chance to reflect, a chance to, to thank God for blessing them with this child. So that's the point that they're at. Before Mary and Joseph, and month and a couple weeks old, baby Jesus... Go to the temple. I want to make something real clear this morning, real clear right now, that what Mary and Joseph and Jesus are doing is not unusual or special. I mean, it's holy, yes. It's obedient, yes. But it's not anything out of the ordinary. All families were supposed to take their firstborn son, all Jewish families, to the temple to be dedicated to God. It's a sign that stretches back to the time of Moses when God passes over the firstborn. It's a way to say thank you to God for allowing their firstborn to exist and to dedicate them and bless them to God's service. What Mary and Joseph are doing is what they have to do, what they need to do. This is a prescription, this, this ritual, that is for everyone. It doesn't matter how much money you have. And the Old Testament makes that real clear. If you were wealthy, you had to sacrifice a, a lamb and a bunch of birds for this ritual. But if you were poor, a few birds would do. This is where we get the idea that Jesus didn't have a lot of. Look in Luke, what we just read. They only have to do the bird offering. So we get a very ordinary post-Christmas story. Going about doing the normal daily things of life. And then we get Simeon. 
whose job it is to enter into the ordinary and completely disrupt it. That's what he is called to do. Who is Simeon? Simeon is the best of what we know we should be. We don't know a lot about it, but we know this. He lives in Jerusalem. He's devout. He's righteous. We should be devout and righteous. He wasn't there to witness the birth of Christ. Neither were we. And he cannot wait for the consolation of Israel, which is just a fancy way to say that he can't wait for God to come down here and fix what's wrong. We know what that feels like. Every time you watch the news and you ask yourself, how, when, when is this going to end? We're waiting for God to do something, to send a savior. And I use the word savior and I use it purposefully because Luke is the only one of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that actually use the word savior as a proper name for Jesus. Luke takes this saving stuff very, very seriously. We also know that Simeon is filled with the Holy Spirit, which at first glance you would think separates him from you and I, but it doesn't. Because as Baptists, as Christians post the book of Acts, we believe in our baptism that the Holy Spirit rests on each one of us. Baptism is a symbol of that. So just like Simeon, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Simeon has heard the Holy Spirit in his life twice. The first time, it's to say, Simeon, you will not die until you see the Savior, until you see the Messiah, until you see the one God has sent to fix it. And the second, the second request from the Holy Spirit is, remember when I told you you'd see it? Well, here's where you look. And what we don't know is how much time passed in between. I like to over-romanticize the Bible in my mind. And I like to imagine that Simeon, I'll over-romanticize it for you too. We don't know how old he was. So I like to imagine that Simeon was born hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. And he's told, you're not going to die until you see God's Messiah. And this man lives lifetime after lifetime after lifetime waiting for God's promise to be revealed to him. Every single time he sees a brother or sister of the faith abused or punished or neglected, he is asking God with all he has, is it time now? Right now. Look at what's going on. Is it time? Lifetime after lifetime after lifetime of this. Before finally he's shown where to look. Now, we don't know how old Simeon was. He might have been younger than I am. It might have only been a couple of days between vision one and vision two, but I like to think about it that way. And the reason I like to think about it that way is notice the excitement that Simeon has to get there. Simeon does not casually walk up to Mary and Joseph and ask politely if he can hold their infant child. Grabs a baby, holds it up and proclaims that he can now die in peace because he's seen the hope and salvation of the whole world. He's not going to wait around anymore. He's been waiting far too long. What I want for us this post-Christmas season is to be more like Simeon. To run to where the Holy Spirit is leading us. To run to the Christ. To look in the eyes of Christ and see the eyes of our Creator I want us to come to church like our kids come to the children's sermon. Stomping down the stairs and running as fast as they can and pushing each other up. And then slide tackling their way onto the marble. Like that's Simeon to me. This man running through the aisles of Walmart. That's how I want us to come to church. How I want us to pray. How I want us to read scripture. How I want us to serve. That's what post Christmas Christianity should be running headlong towards the spirit with every single piece of who we are. I wish I could stop there. But I recognize that I can't tell you to do this and recommend this without also 
calling to, to mention the difficulty in doing so. Simeon understood. When Simeon is running towards the Holy Spirit, he is in a very literal and real way running toward his own mortality. He will not die until he sees this baby. He's running toward his own death. And he sees it as a gift. He's excited, slide tackling excited about it. When you follow the Holy Spirit, it is not going to always be easy. Look at what Simeon had to say to the mother of the Savior. He had to look this woman in the eye and say the hardest thing that anyone has ever said to any mother in history. Your son, while he's going to change the world, your son is going to be opposed, rejected, suffer at the hands of those he seeks to save. And it's going to hurt you worst of all. It's going to feel like a sword has pierced your soul. Simeon knows he has to say this, and you and I both know that if it was me, I wouldn't want to. But Simeon understands that when the Holy Spirit guides you somewhere, you have to be all in. The only answer to what I, what am I going to do now is to be all in in that kind of way. The greatest blessing that I get to receive at work, a lot of people don't talk about their work as a blessing. Some days mine isn't, but the best, the best days are when I get to see your Simeon moments. I'm a minister of youth and missions. I get to be the phone call that someone makes or the lunch that I, I get to go to where I get to hear where they saw the eyes of God. I went to lunch with Elaine and Ann who don't know that I'm going to talk about them at worship this morning. And they just got back from a mission trip to Belize where they cared for children uh, in need. And I asked them all these questions about what their trip was like and what they saw and what they did and what they ate. And I saved the only question I really cared about until the end. Where did you see God? This is the only question that mattered. And the question that brought out laughter and tears. As they shared with me that they saw God in the faces of these children who lived and laughed and loved without any realization or sadness about the conditions that they lived in. You didn't know I'd mention you either. I got to be the phone call that Adam McIntyre made when he felt God calling him to organize a mission trip for our graduating senior. A trip overseas, a trip to Africa to change their lives and to change the lives of others. And I can tell you, you can always tell when someone has seen the face of God, when the words that they share to tell you about it are louder than all of the reasons that you can come up with that it's going to be difficult. I've seen it in Joanne. When she and her team set aside fear, set aside uncertainty to truly stand and ask God and ask the Holy Spirit, what God needs and wants for this congregation and our Sunday school time. There's a passion in following the Holy Spirit. A passion that's going to require something hard, but that's what I want for all of us. I want it. I want it so bad. You can tell I'm a good Baptist because I start with a parable and end with a testimony. When I read the story of Simeon I can't help but see in that story that part of myself, the day that I knew I was going to die because I had accomplished all that I had set out to do, I had accomplished everything that God had given to me to do. I really believed this. I was 17 years old. I preached for the first time. I was telling somebody this morning, they said, why do you walk around while you preach? I walk around because... When I first started preaching, I shook so bad when I stood behind a pulpit that if I walked around, no one would notice. It took a lot for me to get up there. And I believed 
that the next morning after I went to bed, I was going to wake up looking at the face of God. I was not going to wake up here on earth. I knew it. I knew that I had accomplished everything God had given me to do. I, it wasn't that I was sad about my life. I was excited that I had accomplished it. Simeon's song is sometimes called the Nuke Dimittis. Uh, it's Latin. I had to call a friend so that he could teach me how to pronounce it. It's nice to know a guy. Nunc Dimittis. It means to be let go. That's what Simeon experiences. First thing he says to God is, I can die. I'm free. I've done what you need me to do. So here I was thinking that I was in that same position, thinking that I could pray the nuke Dimitis. And I realized when I woke up the next morning that God wasn't done with me. I cannot express to you the level of fear and anxiety and uncertainty that a 17-year-old who already thought he was done feels when he realizes that there's more. That all of the uncertainty and fear and all of those things that I went through to get to that point, this was just the beginning. And I realized something that day that if you're breathing, God needs you. If you're breathing, God is calling you. If you are breathing, the Holy Spirit is resting on you and it is time to disrupt what is ordinary. I'm going to say something crazy now, so if you're going to tune in now, this is the time. We spent a whole lot of time preparing for Christmas, and I love Christmas. But today, today is the time for us to recognize that Christmas is over, and we need to quit running toward Bethlehem. The manger is empty. The Holy Family has gone home. But that does not mean that we have missed Jesus didn't mean that to Simeon, and it doesn't mean it for us. It means that we are called to seek out not a Christ that's about to be born, but a Christ that lives among us. I want us to be like Simeon, to run headlong into what God is calling us to do. I said I want you to disrupt the ordinary. What's ordinary for Simeon is the temple, is these rituals, and is the suffering of his people. What is ordinary for us, and I hate to say this, is the suffering of our people. We watch the news. It's on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and anything. You can't walk 10 steps without hearing how there is darkness in the world. And it's so prevalent that it's ordinary. And the time has come for us to recognize that Christ is present in that too. Maybe you are the one being called to step out and find him and then share it with us. Simeon's story is amazing, but there's one thing that we have that he didn't. We're both post-Christmas believers. But we in this room are also post-Easter believers. Post-Pentecost believers. Post-Book of Acts believers. Not only do we get to know that Christ was born, but we get to know what he looks like, what he did, and what he, he sacrificed. The major difference is this. Simeon was allowed to see God in the form of one person. But because of Christ's sacrifice and the Holy Spirit, we are given the opportunity, the urgency, and the calling to see Christ in all people. As you leave this space, I want you to ask yourself a question. What am I supposed to do now? Our answers are going to be different. They're going to be hard. But they're going to be right. At this time, if you feel so led to come forward, to recognize that you have seen the face of God and you want to get baptized, we want to welcome you up to do so. There's nothing more exciting for us. If you want to become a part of this church, if you want to say, I want to be one of you, walking alongside of you as we run toward Christ, we invite you to come forward and join this church. Be a part of this fellowship of faith. We're about to sing, go tell it on the mountain. I can think of no fitter song for post-Christmas people. So I invite you, when you sing this, to sing it loud.
to sing it like you have seen the face of Christ because you wouldn't be here if you hadn't and to share it with all you've got. If you'll stand up, our hymn is a hymn of response, number 95, Go Tell It on the Mount.